Hi, David Mould here. Welcome to our website. Chances are you're here because of a video you've seen or one you've been told about. Either the Should Ted Wilson Be Impeached series, or the Adventist Crime Scenes series, or maybe even the Road to Tivoli. Whatever it is that led you here, let me introduce you to a video that's on par with all of these. It's entitled, This Isn't Your Grandmother's Great Controversy. And it's about our efforts at republishing a newer, more comprehensively illustrated edition of Ellen White's classic, The Great Controversy. Incorporating a three-screen effect, visually it's the most appealing and movie-like production we've ever undertaken. Its emphasis, of course, is chapter one of the great controversy, the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, while others are having a field day on the internet bashing Mrs. White and slandering her name, we're not ashamed of her. Personally, I love the ground she walked on. But what else would you expect the devil to do? He knows the scriptures. He knows revelation. He knows Mrs. White's inspired interpretation of key prophecies in the book of Revelation. He knows how much these prophecies expose him. And he knows how much they expose the Antichrist, the Popes, and the Roman Catholic Church. He simply can't afford for these prophecies to get out in any major way to the public. So bash her, smear her, hurt her any way he can. He has already shut down the press through which many of Mrs. White's prophecies or predictions were published. That's the review, by the way. Left to him, he would wipe her off the map completely or drag her name through the mud to the point where it would stink to high heaven and nobody, I said nobody would want to read a word she had been. Discouraging readership is his business. Turning people away from the truth is his business. Next to murder and religious persecution, slander is his best tool. And with the internet, you can slander so easily. No legal hoops to jump through. You just sit, write, smear, and click. I know what I'm talking about. It's incredible, but some people read this stuff and never stop to think it could be a pack of lies. For example, Mrs. White never said men had sex with beasts and that the union produced an amalgamated species of man. She never said it. Yet a couple of years ago, I watched a primetime television program in which two men, Two very persuasive men sat and with a clever use of words virtually fed an entire nation that lie. Who knows how many tens of thousands walked away from their television sets cocksure Ellen White was demented and utterly false prophet. Friend, I can't just listen to Satan slander and remain quiet. I can't just watch Mrs. White being bashed and blooded and not open my mouth in her defense. How would you react? If somebody willfully, knowingly slandered your husband or your wife, you'd rush to their defense. That's what you do. Well, I know slander. And it angers me to see Mrs. White portrayed as delusional, mad, a liar, a thief. Yes, a thief. Hasn't she been accused of stealing the ideas and writings of others? You realize that as a young woman, Ellen Harmon, that's what she was before she became Ellen White. Do you realize a 17-year-old Ellen Harmon never wanted the prophetic gift? It wasn't something she coveted. In fact, she dreaded it. Listen to how she puts it in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, pages 62 and on. I'm going to put it up on your screen. In a second vision, which soon followed the first, I was shown the trials through which I must pass and that it was my duty to go and relate to others what God had revealed to me. My health was so poor that I was in constant bodily suffering and to all appearance had but a short time to live. I was but 17 years of age, small and frail, unused to society and naturally so timid and retiring that it was painful for me to meet strangers. I prayed earnestly for several days and far into the night that this burden might be removed from me and laid upon someone more capable of bearing it. But the light of duty did not change. I was unreconciled to going out into the world and dreaded to meet its snares and opposition. 
I had little self-confidence. It seemed impossible for me to perform this work that was presented before me. To attempt it seemed certain failure. The trials attending it appeared more than I could endure. How could I, a child in years, go forth from place to place, unfolding to the people the holy truths of God? My heart shrank in terror from the thought. I coveted death. You hear that? I coveted death as a release from the responsibilities that were crowding upon me. The little lady actually coveted death. She wanted to die rather than fulfill the call of God on her life. I doubt at that time she saw what was coming. I doubt she saw the lies, the hatred, the smear campaign. I doubt she saw what I saw on national television in Jamaica. Bottom line, she was no eager beaver prophetess itching to flaunt her stuff, eager to rebuke the world. She was on no ego trip, picked out of a crowd in much the same way the Virgin Mary was handpicked. She was called by the living God to the prophetic office. So yes, the slander she receives today bothers me. Mrs. White simply doesn't deserve the lies and the caricatures painted of her all over the internet. No more, for example, than the Waldenses deserved over a thousand year period to be systematically slaughtered by the Roman Catholic Church because of the slander let loose on them. What kind of slander? Some monarchs were told by the Catholic Church that the clergy that the Waldensian babies had four rows of teeth and were lower than the animals. You get this gem from the 19th century minister and Scottish theologian J.A. Wiley, an authority on Protestantism, who Mrs. White quotes repeatedly in the great controversy. No, the Waldenses didn't have four rows of teeth. The real reason these godly people were slaughtered by the popes and their armies is that they held to the tenets of the Bible and refused to acknowledge the Roman Catholic Church as any part of the Church of Christ. And yes, the slander against them worked. For over a thousand years it worked, as the Waldenses were repeatedly hunted, often in the dead of winter, sometimes fleeing higher and higher up into the mountains that were their home, there to freeze to death or to hide inside caves where even there they still sometimes died. On one occasion that we'll cover in chapter 4, as huge stones were placed by the invading armies in front of the cave inside which many of the Waldenses had fled, a fire was lit which promptly suffocated the hundreds inside. Even their animals perished. Everybody perished. Young and old, infirm and strong, men, women, children, everybody perished because of slander. Don't tell me to be quiet. A friend, I'm not just prepared to let the slander against Mrs. White work like that, snuffing out her writings and like a thick cloud covering her name with shame. Somebody has to stand up for her. Let me tell you a thought that's coming to me right now. Three times in Nehemiah 13, we read where Nehemiah prayed, Remember me. The first is in verse 14. Remember me, O my God, concerning this. And wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. The second is in verse 22. Hear him again. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. And the third time is in verse 31. He simply says, Remember me, O my God, for good. Right now I feel like praying Nehemiah's prayer. In coming to the defense of your prophet, O God, in trying to wipe the spit off her face, remember me, for good. Blot out my sins. Remember only the good. As David cried in the Psalms, be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresses me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up. For there be many that fight against me, O thou most high. What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. 
Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. That's Psalm 56, 1 to 6. It was Abigail who poignantly reminded David, because you fight the battles of the Lord, the Lord will certainly make you a sure house. That's 1 Samuel 25, 28. And so I pray. And so I toil. You know, talk about fighting the battles of the Lord. Let me deviate for about 30 seconds here. There's so much more I want to do for the Lord than what you're seeing here. There's a telecast I want to produce right where I saw the lies told about Mrs. White. By that I mean right there on Jamaican television. I want to buy prime time just like they had prime time. Two weeks in a row just like they had. I've asked Dr. Bill Andres to help me rebut the slander and I might ask others too but it's got to be done. Make that a matter of prayer with me please. All right commercial done. We'll talk about that telecast another time. But it's not just slander that Satan has unleashed against her. In addition to trying to destroy her name I believe the other part of the devil's plan to keep her writings in obscurity is to have laws passed that will make publishing books like The Great Controversy a hate crime. Did you hear the Pope's response to the Charlie Hebdo killings? I'll put him up on the screen for a quick moment. Non si può provocare, non si può insultare la fede degli altri. He wants laws passed to prevent anyone from saying anything that would offend anyone's religious sensibilities. Why should that surprise us? Do you really think the Pope is concerned about people making disparaging remarks against Islam, whom his predecessors slaughtered? Not at all. He's protecting the Roman Catholic Church. That's who he's protecting behind this charade. He doesn't want Roman Catholicism's ugly, blood-curdling history to be brought before the world. He doesn't want books like Chiniquis and Harris, which expose the role of the Vatican in the assassination of President Lincoln. He doesn't want those books to see the light of day. Nor does he want the involvement of the Vatican in the Holocaust and the escape routes they provided for some 20,000 Nazis at the end of World War II to ever make it into the mainstream. But it's going to come. It's all part of what we Seventh-day Adventists call the loud cry. The sins of Babylon are going to be exposed before the entire world, regardless of what the Pope has to say about not offending religious sensibilities. It's going to come. Why? Because God has ordained it so. Revelation 18 is all about that final cry. Come out of her, my people. If we're to call God's children in Babylon out of her, then it stands to reason that we must give them ample reason to leave. It was Thomas Jefferson who wrote, No experiment can be more interesting than that we are now trying, and which we trust will end in establishing the fact that man may be governed by reason and truth. Our first object should therefore be to leave open to him all the avenues to truth the most effectual hitherto found is the freedom of the press it is therefore the first shut up by those who fear the investigation of their actions that's Thomas Jefferson in a letter to judge John Tyler June 28 1804 what is Jefferson talking about freedom of the press and what did he call it quote the first shut up by those who fear the investigation of their action we're talking about the Pope's response to Charlie Hebdo but I want to give you the backdrop of why I'm saying the things that I'm saying that's what the Pope is trying to do to blunt discussion to stop discussion to shut up the press do you think the papacy has forgotten that it was the press that sparked the Protestant Reformation? It wasn't Martin Luther traveling all over Europe that toppled the papacy and gave the beast its deadly wound. It was Martin Luther's tracks. 
his printed material. Roman Catholicism has always hated a free press. Is it any wonder that since that day when Luther planted his theses on the castle church door in Wittenberg, popes of plenty have sought to have speech censored and books inimical to the faith banned? Have we forgotten the Index Liborium Prohibitorium? That index of books first banned by Pope Paul IV in 1559. Have we forgotten that that index, which included the Bible, you read the Bible and you were killed. Have we forgotten this power? That index that was revised repeatedly over the centuries was only abolished by Pope Paul VI in 1966. Men were flying in space about to land on the moon, but the Vatican was still in the dark ages. Go read the syllabus of errors put forth by Lincoln's contemporary Pope Pius IX. Even before him, in Peter de Rosa's Vicars of Christ, page 146, we find the following. Gregory the 16th in Mirari Voss of August 1832, they gave their their bulls and their encyclicals, fancy Latin names. But Gregory the 16th is the Pope who is writing. He described liberty of conscience as a mad opinion. This is Catholicism. Religious liberty was said to flow from the most fetid fount of indifferentism. He condemned freedom of worship. That's the Pope. Freedom of the press. That's the Pope. Freedom of assembly and education as a filthy, sewer full of heretical vomit those are not my words those are the words of the Pope did you get that what was Pope Gregory saying he condemned freedom of the press as part of a filthy sewer filled with heretical vomit that's Protestant vomit get it through your head freedom of the press freedom of worship freedom of assembly those american values that's not catholicism those are protestant values what the pope calls protestant vomit so how did i move from one pope gregory the sixth to include them all do they all feel the same way about freedom of the press does the current pope feel this way in a breathtakingly frank analysis of the papacy, former Jesuit author Peter de Rosa, in Vicars of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy, page 138, writes, quote, All popes drive by the rearview mirror, a past long thought dead, often called tradition, drives every papacy. One Dead Pope is more revered than a thousand living bishops. End quote. This isn't some flake writing. This is Peter de Rosa, formerly the Dean of Theology at Corpus Christi College. He's describing the mind of the papacy. What he's telling us is, is that precedent rules. Just like the Supreme Court where the rulings of other Supreme Courts and judges are taken into consideration when deliberating any case. So at the Vatican, the rulings of other popes are of more weight, according to De Rosa, than a thousand living bishops. That having been said, what should we conclude? Rather than being viewed as an unwelcome relic of the past, Pope Gregory and his declarations against freedom of conscience ought to be taken very, very seriously. This is the mind of the Vatican. This is the mind of the papacy. This is the will of the papacy echoed and re-echoed throughout the 19th century by popes who fulminated against the United States and her constitution as she was coming into strength. As Mrs. White herself reminds us, it is the boast of Rome that she never changes. The principles of Gregory the Seventh and Innocent the Third are still the principles of the Roman Catholic Church. And had she but the power, she would put them in practice with as much vigor now as in past centuries. That's from the Great Controversy, page 581. 
And it's not just the press that they hate. By extension, we can conclude the internet too. For like the press, it exposes them. If I had the money to film, I'd preach a sermon in a month or two about what I believe the Vatican intentions are in this whole crisis with ISIS and Islam. Lincoln Steele and I have discussed some of this in More Than Waco. It's also mentioned in this video to which I'm pointing you, but the sermon percolating on my brain today, in fact, you can hear some of it coming out even as I speak, that sermon goes where nothing I have ever preached has gone before. Bottom line, I believe this crisis with ISIS and Islam is being manipulated by the papacy for the purpose of introducing a new set of prohibited books, a new index laborium prohibitorium. That's a new index of prohibited books, one that will wipe books like the Great Controversy off the map. That's where it's going. When you hear the Pope stand up and say that we shouldn't make offensive remarks about other religions, that's where it's going. He is bringing back what his predecessors have said, just as the Bible predicted, the beast with the deadly wound will live.